everybody. Welcome back to Let's Talk Physical Media. I am your host, John, and this is the weekly physical media show where we talk all things in the world of film and, of course, physical media. And we like to start the show off every single week with the news. And we were waiting for it. We were waiting for Shout and Scream Factory to announce their spooky season announcements. You know, we ju- we already got Arrow Video and Criterion. I was a little underwhelmed by both of them, mostly Criterion. But you know what? We also got Trick or Treat announced from Arrow Video. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. And, you know, maybe I'll get that Hellraiser, you know, Quad Trilogy, the Quartet of Terror, or the Quartet of Torture. I always get it mixed up, but, you know, we're getting it released here in the U.S. Maybe I'll grab that, but I'm definitely going to get Trick or Treat from Arrow Video. But we were waiting for Shout and Scream Factory's announcements, and they did not disappoint. First up, Death Becomes Her. This is the movie that stars Goldie Hawn, Bruce Willis, and Meryl Streep. This is actually one that I wanted to rewatch pretty recently, so now I'll just get this 4K Blu-ray. So I'm pretty excited about that one. The Wolfman, that's one, you know, this is probably a little bit lower on my list we also got devil this one was produced by m night Shyamalan. i know a lot of people don't like this movie and don't like the twist in this movie because it really is kind of a bait and switch kind of deal where they make you think one thing it's really just for the shock value this ending but i still kind of enjoy devil you know it all takes place in one location and i think it's actually a pretty good movie and i think if you haven't seen it in years you should revisit devil and now you'll be able to on 4k blu-ray and then another one that got announced was drag me to hell this is the sam raimi horror movie that came out i believe in the late 2000s this is actually a really good one i have a lot of fond memories of this one i just revisited this one a couple of years ago another one with a really shocking ending you think you're building up towards a happy ending no siree this is not a happy ending but it is a great ending it is actually one of sam raimi's better movies if you haven't seen this one i definitely can recommend that and again coming to 4k blu-ray i think drag me to hell is definitely a day one purchase for me and the other one that's definitely a day one purchase and this is one i'm most excited about is shocker and shocker is my third favorite wes craven film only behind of course the classics of a nightmare on elm street and scream i really love shocker this is just a classic of the cocaine 80s because this movie is just flat out insane i always forget the guy's name who plays skinner on x files but he's the star of this movie he really plays he's the antagonist and our protagonist is played by peter berg who i always forget was an actor because he did all those movies with mark Wahlberg, and that's probably what he's most most known for now he's not the greatest of actors uh he's fine in this movie but you're really there for the film itself and everything that's going on because it's just it's just insane shocker and i can't wait to review that 4k blu-ray here on the channel when it comes out in october that's the one that really stood out to me land of the dead is also coming to 4k blu-ray so for people who want to complete that george a romero Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead, you know, all of those movies. I still think that the best one is Dawn of the Dead, but a lot of people like Day of the Dead as well. And of course, it's Night of the Living Dead is an all-time classic and really started the zombie craze that is still going to this very day. So we got so many announcements from Scream Factory. They did not let us down when it comes to spooky season and their spooky season announcements. I still am most excited, though, for Shocker and Drag Me to Hell. Those are definitely my day one purchases. I might grab Devil. I'm not sure. I also might grab Death Becomes Her. I'm really in the mood to watch that, but I don't know if I could justify all those purchases in spooky season because those aren't the only things that are coming out in October. Uh, One that I called coming a long time ago last year when it came out on Blu-ray. I'm like, this is going to come to 4K Blu-ray next year. And sure enough, Sony is going to be releasing Thanksgiving, the Eli Roth film, on 4K Blu-ray on October 15th. Uh, This wasn't a surprise to me at all. Honestly, I knew this was going to happen. This happens all the time with horror movies where it'll come to Blu-ray first. And then for some reason... Uh, somewhere down the line, we'll get a 4K steelbook of it on regular old 4K Blu-rays. So for the people who were forced to double dip now, which is unfortunate, which is what really bothers me the most, is that, you know, you could have just released it on 4K Blu-ray initially, but I guess, you know, they wanted to get ahead of it, have it come out for spooky season. But I really think this is actually already one of the best movies to watch on Thanksgiving, along with planes, trains, and automobiles, because there's not too many great Thanksgiving movies out there. You really have to search high and low for them. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is an all-time classic, but Thanksgiving, on the horror end of things, is actually really good, and I really enjoy that movie. It is by far my favorite Eli Roth movie, and that's coming to 4K Blu-ray in October. Another one that we, you know, me and Frank talked about this and all the other spooky season announcements on Monday on Collector's Corner, which I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you didn't, you can watch the replay here on the channel. We talked about the, you know, the Paramount, whatever, the Scream release volume two. They did this last year. Then, of course, all those movies have solo individual releases. We're getting Sweeney Todd. That's the last one of that first volume that is going to be coming to 4K Blu-ray in September. But this year, you can get Friday the 13th Part 2, Breakdown, which is a fantastic Kurt Russell movie. I think it came out in 1997. I really like that movie. World War Z, which has a solo 4K Blu-ray release. I actually think it's 
it's through Scream Factory. And then Orphan First Kill, which I don't really have too much of a desire to see. And these will have exclusive slip covers on there, and they'll come in that really nice box set. But here's the thing. These will eventually get solo 4K Blu-ray releases, and I don't necessarily want Orphan First Kill. Uh, Friday the 13th Part 2, like, I like that on 4K Blu-ray, I guess. I'm not the biggest fan of Friday the 13th Part 2. And then, of course, World War Z. I'm not the biggest fan of World War Z either. That's why I haven't picked up the other 4K Blu-ray. And I don't imagine that one will probably come out of that set, mainly because Scream Factory, I think, has the solo rights to this. You'll see this, like, how in the UK... Child's Play Part 1 has a Blu-ray release over there because Scream Factory has the solo rights to the 4K Blu-ray and they couldn't release that over there. So, you know, I can imagine that World War Z kind of has some sort of contract or whoever the studio is or maybe Paramount, you know, maybe that deal expired and now they can release World War Z on 4K Blu-ray. I'm not entirely sure, but it is pretty strange that World War Z would be packed in this set when it already has a solo 4K Blu-ray release from a boutique label. So that was one thing that stood out to me. The one I want most, and what I'm hoping it's a 4K solo release pretty soon, is Breakdown. Out of all those movies, I love Breakdown the most. That's a very underrated Kurt Russell movie that you guys should check out if you haven't seen it. And then something that we talked about probably about a month ago, but finally got confirmed, Studio Canal is going to be releasing a 75th anniversary edition of The Third Man, and this is a fantastic movie if you guys have never seen this. I've only seen it twice, and I haven't seen it in years but I love the score to this movie it's uh, one of my favorite scores of all time mainly because it's just so different and unique but definitely check out the third man it's a great mystery movie it's a great suspense movie I could definitely recommend that one um, now the thing is Studio Canal is going to be releasing that and I believe Criterion had previously released it on Blu-ray but I think it's out of print I imagine that Criterion will be releasing the 4K Blu-ray of that at some point, just like Seven Samurai got announced for a UK 4K Blu-ray release. We knew this was coming, and at some point, which I imagine maybe even for November, we'll probably get Seven Samurai announced for a 4K Blu-ray release, which I will then replace my Seven Samurai Blu-ray. I, I really wanted to check that out in theaters, but unfortunately, it wasn't playing anywhere in my theaters, although they are going to have Lawrence of Arabia playing this weekend. I really wish I could check that out on the big screen, but they're not putting it in Adobe Theater or anything, so it might not even be worth it. But that was it as far as this week's announcements go, and Screen Factory definitely didn't let us down. Shad Factory didn't let us down with their 4K Blu-ray announcements for Shocktober. I'm really excited about them. I'm really excited for the third man, and Thanksgiving, I'll get to revisit it this year on 4K. Don't let that one slip by, you guys. That really is a great slasher. It feels like it came from the 1980s, and if you're a fan of 1980s slashers, you're going to absolutely love Thanksgiving. Even if you're not a fan of Eli Roth, like I'm not really a fan of his work, but I do really enjoy that movie. So anyway, let's kick it over to the Q&A portion of this week's show. And the first question isn't really a question, but it's a pretty fun one. It's from our buddy 021OM6, and he said, In Die Hard with a Vengeance, Simon Peter Gruber leaves riddles for Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson to solve. Here's one of them for you. And no, it's not the infuriating water juggle puzzle. And the riddle is, as I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife has seven sacks. Every sack had seven cats. Every cat had seven kittens. Kittens, cats, sacks, and wives. How many were going to St. Ives? What is the answer? Um, and this was actually in the movie, and I can I wasn't 100% sure of this, but I talked to the guy at my regular Joe job. I told him the riddle, and he's like, oh, I remember this from Die Hard with a Vengeance. I'm like, yeah, that's where it's from. I'm like, do you remember what the answer was? And he's like, I think it was 555-0001, which means only one person is going to St. Ives is the answer, and that one person is the person, the narrator, who is saying that. So that's what the answer is. I think it has something to do with, you know, someone's go, only he's going to St. Ives while everyone else is coming from St. Ives. I think that that's what the answer was. I needed some help on this. I am terrible with riddles. Everyone always talks about how Joel Schumacher and Batman Forever and how that movie is like terrible with the riddles. All the Riddler's riddles are really simple. Like, you're as blind as a bat. I'm like, you know, those were those were a little tough for me. I, I'm just, I don't know what it is. My mind just can't wrap itself around riddles. So even though I just had to go by memory of, you know, from Die Hard with a Vengeance, which is a criminally underrated sequel. I always rope it in with the sequels. I'm guilty of that as well, where I always say, all the Die Hard sequels are terrible. I always forget that Die Hard with a Vengeance actually doesn't feel like a complete rehash of the Die Hard movies that came before. Die Hard 2 is basically just Die Hard again, you know, right down to pretty much very similar plot points. While Die Hard with a Vengeance, you know, we're finally in New York City. We add Samuel L. Jackson only one year after they were in uh, Pulp Fiction, and their paths only really cross in that. And Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson just have great chemistry, and that movie is fantastic. I absolutely love Die Hard with a Vengeance. I always forget about it. I'm very guilty of roping that in with all the other sequels. I don't even really like Die Hard 2, just because it's the same movie. I'll just watch the original, which is an all-time classic, so... 
you know, that's just kind of my two cents on it. But that's a great question. I thought it was funny that you actually asked a, a riddle, and you know, I was like, oh man, what is it? I can't remember. And I, I have to just rewatch. It made me want to just rewatch Die Hard: Vengeance. So thank you, O two One O M Six. I really do appreciate that. Uh, it's a fun one for this week. And then the next question is from our buddy Kevin Kruger. It's going to be our first top ten list of the week. And he wrote, "What are top? What are the top ten movies that you appreciate, but you don't like the movie all that much?" And this is going to be a list that I'm sure is going to aggravate some people because you know it's going to come down to like some people who might love these movies, and I just, I, you know, I can appreciate the craft of them, but I don't love them myself. Um, so I'm going to start at the bottom, and at number ten, I have The Little Mermaid. This is the one that kicked off the Disney Renaissance. This was a huge deal in the 1980s. Without this movie, we probably wouldn't have gotten Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, which I think are much better movies than The Little Mermaid, but The Little Mermaid to a lot of people is their favorite Disney movie of all time, and I can appreciate the film. It's a very well-made movie. It's even gotten a live-action remake, just like all the other classic Disney films, unfortunately, at this point, none of which are as good as the original animated movies, but still, we eventually ended up with The Lion King, which is one of my all-time favorite films, and you gotta give a lot of that credit to The Little Mermaid, because Disney wasn't doing too good in their animation department. I think they were actually gonna even shut it down, and this really, you know, helped it take off. And number nine, Hellraiser. That's the same thing when we were talking about earlier when I was saying about the quartet of terror or torture. You know, I only really like Hellraiser 1 or 2, but this franchise is still going to this very day. People love the Hellraiser movies. I watched the first two Hellraiser movies and I enjoy them. I think they are by far the best Hellraiser movies. Hellraiser is weird to me because it always stood out to me because I always loved the box art on the VHSs. I was always wanted to see that movie. I ne didn't end up watching it until I was like 12 or 13, but I would always walk by it in Blockbuster and it always made me want to watch that movie and its sequels. But then when I finally did watch the franchise, I liked Hellraiser 1, I liked Hellraiser 2, and then all those other movies I didn't really enjoy almost at all. And I don't even think I finished them all because I was just like, you know, they were all pretty much direct to video, I think, after three. But still, Hellraiser 1 and Hellraiser 2 are very well made movies and, you know, they connect to each other. It's just I've never been the biggest Hellraiser fan. It always made me feel guilty because I feel like that's like in that like B area of classic horror films or at least classic horror franchises. You know, Hellraiser is right, kind of right there with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it doesn't hit like the Nightmare on Elm Street or Halloween or Friday the 13th levels. It's like kind of right there with Child's Play, but again... It's just not one of my favorites, and I wish it was. At number eight, I got Dances with Wolves. And, you know, I knock this movie all the time because it won Best Picture in 1990 over Goodfellas. I always will believe that Goodfellas got gypped that year, and Martin Scorsese really had to sit and wait for it, finally him to get his flowers. It should have been with Goodfellas because Goodfellas is way better than Dances with Wolves. But, does it, but Dances with Wolves... You know, it is still a very well-made, beautiful-looking movie with some great performances in it. So, you know, I can appreciate the craftsmanship of it, but I just, you know, it's not a movie for me, and I, it'll always be overshadowed by Goodfellas. At number seven, and this is actually one that I'm learning to love a little bit more and actually might end up falling off this list, and that's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Never was one of my favorite John Hughes movies, but now if I look at it as a fantasy movie, I can just sit back and kind of just enjoy it for what it is because I always thought this movie was a little bit ridiculous over the top, and the biggest issue with it is that Ferris is just an asshole like he's not you know he's a terrible friend overall just not a great guy like even you know the principal's a dick but the principal's right throughout the entire movie about him there's everything he's doing he's just trying to basically he's a selfish human being is what it boils down to so it's hard for him to be your protagonist if you don't really like him but it's still got all those John Hughisms. I still love so many scenes in this movie and honestly me and my wife Faith have been enjoying this movie together a lot lately so I can really appreciate it and then the number six I have the Bourne films and these are basically the Matt Damon action films before this no one ever thought Matt Damon could do action movies then the Bourne franchise just it, it took off with the Bourne identity and then you know all the other sequels that came after it were pretty much well received and I never really loved them this is really where shaky cam took off and they abuse the shit out of it and I just don't really love these movies that much but I can appreciate the craftsmanship that went into these again like you know Matt Damon he's great in the role and without this we probably wouldn't get action star Matt Damon and you know we wouldn't get ripped up jacked up Matt Damon so you got to give these movies their due it's just they're not really my franchise I own them on 4k blu-ray but I don't really love them at number five I got the Dark Knight this is one that I know people are gonna get upset with me I I've said it numerous times I still do really enjoy the Dark Knight it's just maybe I've seen it too many times at this point but you know I have the Dark Knight logo tattooed on my wrist this movie at one point it was one of the most important movies to me this is one of those movies that as I've gotten older uh, I've fallen less in love with the movie but I could still appreciate the movie I've 
you know, I, you, if you go back, you guys can listen to me. I'll, I don't want to go too far into the Dark Knight right now because I don't have that much time. But still, you know, this is a movie that I could still appreciate. Heath Ledger is amazing in it. The score is amazing. Christopher Nolan's one of the greatest directors of all time. He's one of my favorite directors of all time. I just think that this is a flawed movie that is still very, very well made. And it's just not one that I absolutely love as much as I used to. I still think Batman 89 is the best Batman film that's ever been made. And at number four, another superhero film that everybody loves, and that's The Avengers. And this is one that I, I still don't really love. I had a great theater experience with this, but then when it, it just didn't translate well as they did at home. And I don't think this movie is shot very well. I think this movie has always looked like uh, pretty cheap looking, in my opinion. It doesn't look like a very cinematic film when it comes to the cinematography. And, you know, yeah, it's cool to see them all finally team up. And that's really what it's about. It's about the spectacle of that. But as far as the movie goes, it's never been one that I love. But again, you have to show your appreciation to this movie because nobody could have ever imagined. We're so spoiled now. It's insane. But nobody could have ever imagined in the 1990s, if you were growing up, that we would to ever get the Avengers on the big screen that we would see this group of superheroes on the big screen so complaining about it is pretty stupid but again I just don't love the movie but still we're so spoiled today with these kinds of movies that you know we take for granted that seeing the Avengers on the big screen is a huge deal you know back in the 1990s nobody I and mean, if you go back to the 1970s when Superman came around I wasn't around for that but you ask those people what they could expect about the Avengers in the 1990s and then ask those people what they would expect about the Avengers in the you know the 2010s None of them would ever believe you, so it's pretty insane, and me complaining about it, it's just, I gotta be honest with you guys. Uh, number three, Being John Malkovich. This is one that I've never really loved, uh, directed by Spike Jones. Um, you know, Charlie Kaufman wrote the movie. This is the one that put Charlie Kaufman on the map. John Cusack. I think that's really one of the big flaws of this movie. I'm just not a big John Cusack fan. I just never have been able to sink my teeth into him as an actor. I can appreciate some of his roles, and I even enjoy him in movies like Con Air. But him in this role, something about this movie. I really appreciate everybody in it. I appreciate, you know, John Malkovich being game for a movie like this. Uh, John Cusack's fine. I just don't love him. Cameron Diaz is even pretty good in this movie. Just not my kind of movie. At number two, I got Lawrence of Arabia. Now, I actually really like Lawrence of Arabia, but I don't absolutely love Lawrence of Arabia. But Lawrence of Arabia cannot be denied as one of the greatest movies that has ever been made. First of all, the scale of it is insanely epic. It looks beautiful. It's so well acted. Peter O'Toole, you can argue, should have won the Academy Award for this. Peter O'Toole should have won at least one Academy Award in his career. But, you know, when I think of David Lean and his epics, the one that I like the most is Bridge on the River Kwai. That is my favorite of those David Lean epics. Now, Lawrence of Arabia, though, it's a four hour and 12 minute journey that you will appreciate, but I can't guarantee you're going to absolutely love it. Like, I can watch a four hour movie, but this one at points, you do kind of feel the pacing of it, but you still have to admire this movie because it is still one of the greatest films of all time. And at number one, you guys probably already knew it, and that is Jaws. Now, this is a movie I absolutely appreciate. I host a show on this channel with one of the biggest Jaws fans. Scratch that. David is the biggest Jaws fan that I have ever met in my life. I, I've heard him go on and on about these movies, and I admire his love for these movies, and I admire everybody who loves the Jaws movies. It's just, you know, it was never a movie I love, and I've always tried to boil down to it as to why that is, and I really think it's the sharks. I just, I'm, I'm not in the sharks. That's the whole thing. I've never really been into, like, aquatic life or the ocean. You know, look at me. I'm the whitest guy in the world, so me and the sun have never gotten along, so I'm not somebody who's hanging out at the beach anyway, so... Maybe I'm just not afraid of sharks because I know that thing ain't walking out of the ocean and sneaking into my house. Now, I find that a lot more scarier than I find a shark. But you still have to admire Steven Spielberg's craftsmanship of the original Jaws movie. And I, we've talked about all the Jaws movies here on the channel. I actually think Jaws 3 is a great time. Jaws 4 gets a bad rap. 2 is pretty good as well. But Jaws, the original Jaws, is an absolute masterpiece. It's just a masterpiece that I probably will never love. And I really wish I did. You know, it really sucks to be a fan of film and not love Jaws as much as other people but maybe one day there's still time that i will eventually fall in love with that movie but that was a great question kevin thank you so much buddy i really appreciate that and our next question is from emmanuel and he wrote what's a movie from netflix that you wish would get a physical media release and we actually have another question from kevin we'll get into in a second that kind of ties into this but 
Netflix has so many great movies that I wish would get a, a physical media release. My favorite being Paddleton. I really wish that movie would get a physical media release. But even like they clone Tyrone, that's one that definitely deserves a physical media release. You know, Netflix is very stingy. Only certain movies get released on physical media, and it's always through the Criterion Collection. So that's only a certain type of movie. So forget about the Fear Street trilogy. Like I want that trilogy on 4K Blu-ray from Shout Factory, like or Arrow Video. It's like sitting right there. But Netflix will never like lease out the rights. God forbid. And it really does bother me because they have so many great movies that i wish we get physical media releases honestly paddleton's number one just because that's my favorite of a lot of all the netflix movies so it'd be pretty weird for me to say anything else but i would really love the fear street trilogy on 4k blu-ray those movies are so fun i actually i think i'm gonna revisit them this fall Unfortunately, it will be on Netflix. So that was a great question, Emmanuel. Thank you so much, buddy. And like I was saying, how that ties into another Kevin question, because Kevin said, what are your thoughts on movies that are theatrically released and not getting physical releases, such as Napoleon, Killers of the Flower Moon, Saltburn, etc. Seems like Apple is within the likes to keep most of their movies on their streaming service without a physical release. Do you think they have the right to do this, or do you think it's BS? Well, you know... Unfortunately, it's their rights. They are absolutely, it's their movies. They own the rights to those movies and they can do whatever the hell they want with it. We don't have to like it, but it's perfectly within reason. It's just that it sucks. It sucks for us, who the physical media collectors. That's the people that get screwed over in this whole thing. Now, does Apple care or does any of these streaming services care? Probably not, but they are leaving money right on the table because, as many of us know, we're still going to pay Netflix. We would just like them on 4K Blu ray so we can give you even more money so we can have them in our collection. I, I, we're not, yes, we're not being greedy we just we want to give you money like you know that's it we want to give you money to give us the stuff we want now napoleon i would have loved that on 4k blu-ray especially that extended cut that i don't even know if it's on apple tv or not I, i'm not even sure because i haven't really thought too much about napoleon other than that one scene i really like but it was a beautiful looking movie and it was a beautiful sounding movie you know got a theatrical release i don't remember what the other studio was that did that with them i know apple the tv funded it but it was a co-funding thing just like killers of the flower moon which i was sure and you can go back and I said it a million times that I thought that Paramount, the uh, co-founder of that, would eventually give us a 4K Blu-ray release of Killers of the Flower Moon. It got an Italian release, but for some reason we didn't get a release anywhere else. So you can import it and watch it on 4K Blu-ray, but if Paramount owns this and Paramount has a physical media department, obviously we talk about them all the time. Why wouldn't they just release it anywhere else? It doesn't make any sense. I, I have to imagine that Apple TV is the one holding on to that. You know, I just, you know, the real answer is that, you know, they have the right to do it. I just don't agree with them doing it, but it is, it's, there's nothing we can do. They own the movies. It's like George Lucas with his Star Wars movies. You know, they're his movies. If he doesn't want anything like changed around from the special editions, you know, I'll, we can all complain all we want, but the guy made those movies. They're his movies. James Cameron, he made Aliens. If he wants to, you know, use AI for it or whatever he wants to do with the uh, 4K restorations, they're his movies it's perfectly within his rights so whoever owns the rights to these movies it's within their rights to do this it's just you know again the physical media community that we get screwed over in it that's the best way to put it but that's a good question kevin i you know i really wish that these big studios were listening to us these streamers and would put out all their movies on 4k blu-ray because again i just want to give you more money and the next question is from rogue one six seven seven our buddy over here and he wrote what would be your favorite steelbooks designs that you have in your collection and what is the worst and underrated design in your collection thanks well i grabbed a few and we'll get the negative out of the way first and that is gattaca uh this is a great movie i love this movie i think the 4k blu-ray is pretty good i've actually wanted to review it here on the channel because i haven't watched it since i got this 4k blu-ray and i know i didn't review it on the channel but this steelbook Man, it's ugly. I, I don't like this, like, burnt orange amber. It probably would have worked better if it was, like, a matte finishing into it. But it's it's all glossy, and, you know, it's kind of tough to see. I get what they were going for, but, you know, a big swing and a miss on this one, in my opinion. It just didn't work. And then I'm going to go with one that's really underrated, because I really think we should have got more of these. And I'm going to have to put the rest down to show you. And I expected, this is from Paramount, I thought we were going to get more of these. I thought this was going to open the floodgates because I thought this was the coolest design in the world. And that's the Running Man on 4K Blu-ray. Again, a great 4K Blu-ray. Matt got to review this here on the channel, and that kills me because I've wanted to talk about the Running Man for so long. But, you know, you get the slipcover, and underneath, you get a steelbook. So, the best of both worlds. You really can't miss with that. You come inside, yeah, it's a black freaking Paramount disc. What do you expect? You know, if it's a 4K Blu-ray, it's in black. If it's a Blu-ray, it's in blue. It would have been cool to get some individual disc design because this 4K Blu-ray, my God, it's fantastic. And again, slipcover over a steelbook. 
What an idea. I just wish we would have got more of them. And then I'm sure a lot of you guys probably know my favorite 4K Steelbook. This is one that came out last year. This is the Point Break 4K Steelbook. I love Point Break. It's one of my favorite movies. Uh, you know, Catherine Bigelow directed the hell out of this. You guys can hear me go on and on about it. But the Steelbook, man, this glossy finish with the matte finish, how things just stand out and pop off it. Like I've said a million times, the cover, the uh, camera just does not do this 4K Steelbook any justice and this is my favorite of all time and then i know you're a big fan of this movie rogue one and i think this steel book is great and that is scott pilgrim versus the world one of your favorite movies of all time and i think this steel book is fantastic very similar to like point break you kind of have like a, a mad finish and a lot of how vinegar syndrome will do their slip covers you know you'll have the flat look while also having the glossy finishing like on the font like scott pilgrim again i don't know if the camera is picking this up but it looks absolutely beautiful and then another one that came out earlier this year and it's just pops because of all the colors and that's killer clowns from outer space really good 4k blu-ray but the steel book is one that i just i fell in love with it and i knew it was going to be one of my favorites of all time right out of the gate just all the colors i love you know bright neon colors you know this isn't the most like bright thing in the world it's still actually kind of dark when you really think about it it's good but it's got this like flat glossy look to it you know i guess semi-glossy would be the way to describe it but it's also got like glossy outline around things it's a beautiful steel book that again camera won't do it any justice You'll notice I like it when they have two finishes on the 4K Steelbooks. It really makes them feel a little bit more special than if they were just, like, flat or anything. Last but not least, you know, I've upgraded a lot of these. I've upgraded Skyfall in this collection to 4K Blu-ray. It doesn't even have Spectre or No Time to Die in it. So it only had the first three Daniel Craig movies in it. And I still hold on to this Blu-ray collection and didn't upgrade them all to 4K Blu-ray because I love this Steelbook. I love what they did. This another one, flat with a glossy finish, like the way it says 007 or Daniel Craig. All that stuff has a gloss to it while everything else looks flat. That's why I've hung on to this for so long. It's because it is one of my favorite Steelbooks. I had to have it. I want them to actually reuse this design and release these all again on 4K Blu-ray and reuse these Steelbook designs. I'll buy them. I swear to God I will. And that was another great question. Thank you, Rogue One. I appreciate that, buddy. And the next one is from Mr. Smelly Potato. And Mr. Smelly Potato is one of our channel directors. And he wrote, if you could sit down and have dinner with an one actor and talk about movies, who would it be? Well, I actually thought of two. And they're two of my favorite actors of all time. I just think they'd be really fun. They seem very, like, humble, down-to-earth type of guys. And they were both in Batman 1989, and that is Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson. You know, both Northeast guys. Michael Keaton's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Jack Nicholson is from Neptune, New Jersey. You know, I live on Long Island. You know, like, I feel like we would have a we would be a, we'd have a mutual understanding of things. We'd get along really well. They seem like very you know down to earth type of guys, and I want to you know pick their brains about all the movies they made and you know my favorite era in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. You know, Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson were there the entire time. I would just love to sit down and I'd talk to both of them. If I can only talk to one, I guess I'd probably pick Jack Nicholson, even though he's. You know, I don't know how he's doing right now. He's an older guy, so maybe I should pick Michael Keaton. He looks like he's getting even bigger right now. He looks really good for his age. Can't wait for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. But that was a great question, Mr. Smelly Potato. Thank you so much, buddy. And the next set of questions is from our other channel director, Frank from Frank's Media and Reviews. And the first question he asked was, favorite natural disaster film? And this might actually surprise you guys because we've talked about Twister and Twisters. But the one that I've always loved is The Day After Tomorrow. This one's directed by Roland Emmerich, the king of disaster movies. It seems like that's all he makes. Yet he made The Patriot. Very strange. But either way, Ari also made Independence Day. He made 2012, which is one I definitely going to revisit pretty soon. And he also made The Day After Tomorrow. I have a really fond memory of seeing this movie in theaters. I thought the effects were really good. I think the story itself is really good. And, you know, it scares you about climate change. And I just had a good time with it. It's one of the movies I always think of Jake Gyllenhaal with. I love Dennis Quaid in this movie. I just think it's a very well-made movie. And, you know, I would love this one on 4K Blu-ray. But I know that might be actually surprising to a lot of people. I don't hear a lot of people bringing up The Day After Tomorrow that much. But I can remember, like, going to a Regal before this movie came out and seeing the big cardboard cutout of the Statue of Liberty with, you know, pretty much all snow up to her neck and, like, the ice around the torch. I, I just thought that was so cool. And I couldn't wait to see the movie. And the movie did not let me down. It's one of those movies that actually lived up to the hype. Yeah, it's a disaster movie. So, uh, you know, I get that a lot of people say it's cheesy and ridiculous. And it is cheesy and ridiculous. I just love it. I really think The Day After Tomorrow is a great movie. Uh, what's your favorite video game? My favorite video game of all time is 2001's Halo. 
this is the game that sold me on Xbox. It's really why I'm still pretty loyal to Xbox when I really shouldn't be. But Halo, that franchise, just it changed me. It really did. I didn't get it until 2002 uh, came out with the launch of the Xbox again. I wasn't sold on Xbox right away. I was a Sony guy. I was a PlayStation guy. I had the PS2. Why did I need an Xbox? We needed an Xbox so you could play Halo. Halo is one of the greatest games of all time. It feels a lot like Aliens. Aliens definitely lent itself so well to the Halo franchise, and Halo owes a lot to Aliens itself. Not the first Alien, but definitely Aliens. Halo Combat Evolved, and it's just one of those games. Also, you know, this is before Xbox Live, so I have a lot of fond memories of playing this game with my brother and my cousins and just playing split screen. It was just an absolute blast. When it got remastered, I played it again. I've probably beaten the campaign like over 20 times. Not many games I can say that about, but I still just love Halo. Every I have all these nostalgic memories about it, and I still think it's one of the greatest games of all time. What is your favorite movie that you listen to in Dolby Atmos? So, my favorite Dolby Atmos track of all time is either Top Gun Maverick, or, actually, this might surprise you guys, I just think that this Dolby Atmos track is phenomenal, and that is Evil Dead Rise. That Atmos track is so well mixed, it's just incredible. I think of the elevator, I think about it all the time, I think about this one scene in the elevator, and just how the sounds were coming out of different channels, and you felt like you were in that elevator. That is the sign of a well mixed Atmos track, and... All these companies have the ability to do that. Or maybe you just need a great sound mixer. Somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing. Because the person who did this, they knew what they were doing. It is such a well-designed Atmos track. Evil Dead Rise is by far the best Dolby Atmos track I've ever heard. But Top Gun Maverick, you know, it's like clipping out its tails. They're really neck and neck. It's a photo finish. Maybe you ask me tomorrow, I'll say Top Gun Maverick. But if I'm ever showing somebody a Dolby Atmos track, those are the two I'm going for. Horror movies really do have some great Atmos tracks. Again, because they are just so well sound design that when they finally get transferred to Atmos even if they're the thing about Evil Dead Rise it's a modern film so the sound design was designed with the movie itself you know when we're remixing stuff for, of an old film you know how are the sound elements that's one thing you know <sighs> when we get a pretty bad Dolby Atmos track from like an older movie, I'm like, it's probably not the people designing this 4K Blu-ray's fault. It probably didn't need a Dolby Atmos track. Maybe that's why Criterion only gives us one audio track. I'm not entirely sure. But that's a great question, Frank, as well. And he has one last question. Who is Fate's favorite actor, and what's her favorite movie of that actor's filmography? Well, Fate's favorite actor is actually Leonardo DiCaprio, who's also one of my favorite actors as well. Maybe that's one reason that me and Faith connected so well. We always love Leo. He really can just, you know, he loves night 19 year olds and he you know he just knows how to connect people and he knows how to connect faith and i and uh i just love leonardo dicaprio and apparently so does my wife that's her favorite actor ever and her favorite performance from leonardo dicaprio was in the wolf of wall street which i can't really deny that's a great movie i think it's one of martin scorsese's best movies it feels a lot like Goodfellas and Casino, but that's not a bad thing because I love Goodfellas and Casino. And Leonardo DiCaprio, this is also a stone cold comedy. It's absolutely hysterical, but that's her favorite movie from him. She also said she really likes him in The Departed, but I still think Matt Damon gives the best performance in The Departed. But hey, that's not my answer. This is Fate's answer, so she went right away with The Wolf of Wall Street. But she said it was tough because Leo's been in so many great movies. And he still, every time he pops up in a movie, even though he doesn't like pop up and take small roles, it's always a big deal, like Killers of the Flower Moon. That was a big deal. And he was great in it. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I think he gave the better performance, but Brad Pitt got the Academy Award. It's the way she goes sometimes. But these are some great questions, Frank. Thank you so much, buddy. And one more Mr. Smelly Potato question. He is our channel director again, and he wrote, What are your favorite movies that when the momentum builds, it never really stops? An example of mine would be Big Trouble in Little China and Speed. And actually, Mr. Smelly Potato, my answer would 110% be Speed. When I rewatched Speed earlier this summer, you know, I was actually going to review the 4K Blu-ray here on the channel. Maybe I still will, but I'll have to rewatch it again. And, and hey, that's no problem. I used to watch Speed all the time when I was a kid. It was one of those movies that I can still quote to this very day, even though I hadn't seen speed in like three years when i finally rewatched it earlier this summer i everything just comes flooding back because i've seen the movie so many times don't get dead and i'm like wow this is an almost five star movie and it really does the momentum you know at the very beginning we're just in with the elevator that's got a bomb in it you know then we kind of take a little bit of a low we think okay where's this movie going we already had this big what feels like climatic scene in the elevator and that's why Jan the bomb was a great director for twister because it has so many of those moments as well in twister where we have a twister then we kind of calm down for a moment but with speed once we get on the bus once we know that that bus has a bomb on it it's just building momentum and building and building until we finally, that's it. We've saved the day. Now, you can argue that we kind of have that 
final scene with the subway again because I guess we have to have three big scenes but none of them are as big as the middle part of that movie with that bus and I just think that this movie is overall it, it's almost a 1990s masterpiece I really cannot sell speed short it's another one of those movies that I absolutely love and that's a great question Mr. Smelly Potato thank you so much buddy and the next one is from Carlos Chavez and he wrote when it comes to black and white movies what are your top 10 also is your opinion looks best in 4k in black and white I made a list for this as well so our second top 10 list of the episode and at number 10, you know, this is a movie, a more modern movie, but they chose to shoot it in a, like the letterbox uh, aspect ratio and in black and white. And this is Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse. This movie is great. Willem Dafoe is so good in this movie. So is Robert Patterson. This is the kind of movie I point to people when they complain about Robert Patterson because they only think about him in Twilight. They don't think he's a great actor. You know, he's great in The Batman, but also check him out in The Lighthouse. It's such a well-made movie, and it looks absolutely beautiful. Choosing to shoot this in black and white was a great decision because it really just helps to A, feel like the early 1900s or late 1890s, and it just feels scary. And some of the use of the light in this movie, the way it looks, it's beautiful. It's a beautifully shot movie. And number nine, the comedy, Young Frankenstein. They wanted this to look like one of the old Universal Monster films, more specifically Frankenstein. But this movie is just absolutely hysterical. You won't see Frankenstein on this list, but you will see Young Frankenstein. Gene Wilder is so good in this movie. Also, Gene Hackman is one little role. He's great in it. Uh, just so many funny scenes. So many great quotes in this movie. Gene Wilder, same year. This is what I mean. Mel Brooks, the very same year. He put this out and he put Blazing Saddles out. Blazing Saddles, I believe, is getting a 4K Blu-ray release this year. Where is the love for Young Frankenstein? And speaking of the Universal Monsters, at number 8, I have my favorite Universal Monster film, The Invisible Man. Uh, the remake that came out, you know, I guess it's like a reimagining from Lee Winnell that came out in, uh, I think, 2020. That movie's great. But the original Invisible Man, the fact that they made this movie in the 1930s and it's this good... It's the best Universal Monster movie, in my opinion. I love the effects in it. it. What they had to do, like, we take for granted our special effects. I complain about them all the time. But, man, they were doing this in the 1930s, and it's incredible. It's all camera tricks, and it's done so well. I love The Invisible Man. Looks beautiful. And number seven, Schindler's List. Now, you could argue there is some color in this movie. It's not a full black and white movie. But it's mostly a black and white movie. And it's one of the best looking movies you'll ever see. A lot of this stuff was done with handheld from Steven Spielberg. He made that choice for this kind of movie. It's got a great John Williams score with it. Came out the very same year as Jurassic Park. Showing us Steven Spielberg. He just never stops working. And John Williams is right there by his side. Number six. This is Stanley Kubrick's Paths of Glory. I think this is the best anti-war film of all time. It stars Kirk Douglas, you know, the father of Michael Douglas, and it's incredible when you watch this movie. It sounds like Mike Doug it sounds like Michael Douglas. You can never mistake that Kirk Douglas was Michael Douglas' father. And this movie is so well done. It has one of the most shocking endings of all time. You think they're gonna get out of it, but just check out Paths of Glory. At number five. I got Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 masterpiece, one of the greatest horror films of all time, one of the best made movies of all time. Again, he could have shot this in color, he shot movies in Technicolor before this, but black and white was a choice, and it was a great choice from Alfred Hitchcock. And number four, Lahine. I didn't see this movie until April of this year. It's such a well-made movie. Again, choice of black and white. It wasn't like something from the 1920s or 30s or even the 1940s where it was like forced upon them. No, they chose to shoot this in black and white in 1995, and thank God they did. And this movie, what really helps it to stand out, not just get coming to Criterion 4K Blu-ray, but the way this movie was shot is beautiful they do plenty of great things with the camera they do the jaws trick you know where we, we zoom in at the same time we're pulling the dolly or the reverse of that we have that shot in this movie it, i mean there's so many great shots it's like an artistic masterpiece this movie and black and white plays a huge part of that at number three casablanca this is just one of the best movies ever made you know it's a cliche at this point but still if you never saw casablanca it's so rewatchable not many movies from the 1940s can hold up this well but this movie holds up and in number two, The Night of the Hunter. This is one that's kind of getting a resurgent, res resurgence recently. And you also asked me, like, what do I think is the best 4K Blu-ray as far as black and white movies go? I think you got right there. You got Lahine from Criterion Collection. And you get The Night of the Hunter 
from Kino Lover. I think those are the two best 4K Blu-rays. Now, the bi- the best reason for that would be the beautiful black and white. This movie, Night of the Hunter, was inspired by German Expressionism. You'll see a lot of shots in this movie that were clearly inspired by German Expressionism, and that's why this 4K Blu-ray looks so good, and that's why the movie itself looks so beautiful. And one of the big key aspects is the cinematography. Again, 1950s, all done with camera tricks. And number one, one of the greatest movies of all time, Citizen Kane. This one is endlessly rewatched for me it's one of the classic films that i think everyone should watch again like casablanca it's pretty cliche to say that you like citizen kane but i'm telling you if you haven't seen citizen kane i guarantee you'll see the inspiration of that movie on so many other films you'll appreciate it and you won't believe that orson welles made this movie at that young of an age it's just it's an incredible movie that still holds up to this very day and was such a human huge inspiration on the film industry in general that not only do i appreciate citizen kane but i generally love citizen kane so thank Thanks, Carlos. That was a great question as well. And we got two more questions, and I like to call these the shooter questions because they're from our buddy Sprazy110, and he always asks the quick questions, and I, I really enjoy that about him. Thank you so much for the Sprazy110. You know, he asks these questions like, what's worse packaging, stack discs or cardboard sleeves? I think stacked discs is by far the worst. It just always makes me feel uncomfortable when you put a disc on a disc. You know, it's like it's like brakes, you know, when you got it's like metal on metal with brakes. That's how I generally feel about it. Like I, I feel like they're gonna scratch, even if they're not gonna scratch. But those cardboard cases, those are terrible as well. Like Criterion did with Citizen Kane, where you got it's always gonna scrape against the cardboard when you're trying to pull it out. Universal loves to do that with like their Fast and Furious box set. I actually think they moved away from it with their last one. They did it with the Back to the Future box set, and they also did it with the Alfred Hitchcock collection. Collections and you just yeah, you don't want to ever scrape the bottom of the disc against something you know you just want that little popper like I don't know what that's called when you press the button it pops up that's what you always want with your discs that's always the best way that's just the best way to feel comfortable now 4K Blu-ray discs they're really hard to scratch you really have to put some effort into it it's not like the DVD days where if, you know a, a cool breeze would probably scratch a DVD but not a Blu-ray you know Blu-rays you know they're not as tough as a 4K Blu-ray but again a Blu-ray is pretty tough so you know. I still would rather them never do this, whether it be with the cardboard or the stacking of the discs, but stacking of the discs are worse. And that leads into your next. Do you return movies they ship with a loose disc rattling around? I actually don't. Uh, I'll always check it first. I won't just return it just because it's rattling around. As long as it's fine, the disc is fine, and there's nothing wrong with the packaging, like, you know, like I was saying with the popper, sometimes those come broken, like they're cracked, and now the disc will never be able to sit in there without popping off, so if you end up just like, pulling it off your shelf it'll just end up popping out then i'll return it because the packaging is broken but as long as the disc is fine and just kind of got messed up while it was shipping sometimes it'll pop out no i won't return it because there's nothing wrong with it as long as there's nothing wrong with it i'll hold on to it but if there's something wrong with it yeah it's going right back to wherever it came from so those were great questions sprazy 110 and i want to thank everybody for their questions this week i really do appreciate it i hope you guys enjoyed this week's show of let's talk physical media i really enjoyed it i love all the questions guys thank you so much I really do appreciate them. And, you know, if you guys want to leave some more questions, you can leave them down in the comments section below. Or And while you're down there, you guys can like this video, subscribe to the channel, share this video if you could. We also have channel memberships. We have a producer's tier where you'll find John Doe Juggalo, Jason Martin. And then we have a director's tier where you're going to find Mr. Smelly Potato and Frank from Frank's Media Reviews. And don't forget that Frank from Frank's Media Reviews, he has a great YouTube channel as well. And I will be on that channel this upcoming Monday with so many other great YouTubers out there. We're going to talk about our favorite 2024 horror films. So make sure you come and join us over on Frank's channel this Monday or tomorrow. And John Doe Juggalo, he has a great YouTube channel as well. So make sure you guys head over there, give them a subscribe. And, you know, if you got no money to throw away, guys, don't worry about it. All I really want is for you guys to enjoy this video. And if you did, make sure you guys get out in those streets, tell your friends about us, and then we'll be seeing you around.